You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Well, good morning from Washington, D.C. Good evening to our colleagues in Thailand and throughout the region. And whatever time and place you're joining us from, most welcome uh, to this program on forging Thailand-U.S. economic partnership, a pathway toward post-COVID-19 recovery. My name is Satu LeMay, I'm Vice President of the East-West Center, and we're absolutely delighted to be partnering with the Royal Embassy of Thailand in Washington, D.C., and the Ambassador for this, the second in a series of programs looking at new directions in the U.S.-Thai relationship and alliance. We have an all-star cast, but before we turn to that, may I welcome uh, our partner in this effort, Ambassador Manasvi, please, sir. Uh, thank you. A uh, warm greetings, uh, Sawati Krupp, to all participants, eminent speakers and panelists joining us today from Thailand and the United States. I wish to thank uh, Dr. Satu, Vice President of East West Center, once again for co-organizing uh, this second series of our talks on building traction to rejuvenate the long-standing Thai-US partnership, which in recent years some of observers have uh, felt that uh, we have been adrift. Uh, the first session focused on the U.S.-Thai perspective on the geostrategic uh, landscape and the regional architecture and underscored the importance of our relations as one of the pillars of peace, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific and Southeast Asia in particular. Uh, today's webinar will focus in greater depth on the opportunities and challenges for Thai-U.S. economic partnership. And I'm very grateful to our distinguished speakers and panelists from the U.S. and Thai side who have kindly agreed to share their thoughts and wisdom on how to build greater traction in the economic realm. They come with great passion, experience, and I'm certain we will come out with much food for thought for our policymakers and practitioners. Allow me to share three areas that opens up opportunities to build back traction in our economic relations. Firstly, I was very elated uh, when Vice President Kamala Harris uh, announced US readiness to host the APEC summit in 2023. Thailand will be hosting the APEC summit in 2022 so we believe that we can build synergy as consecutive hosts to rebuild certainty and confidence in the global post-COVID recovery. Secondly, during the first webinar, many speakers agreed that supply chain resilience and sustainability offers one visible area where Thailand as a gateway to ASEAN and with strong business links with the US can deepen our engagement. Thirdly, as the world is moving towards a more digitized economy and new technologies are rapidly changing the global economic landscape, Thailand, with our aspiration to move towards Industrial 4.0, can serve as a reliable US partner in promoting digital connectivity and economy as an agenda under the ASEAN and Mekong frameworks. I hope our guest speakers and panelists will be able to touch upon some of these issues. And may I wish everyone a fruitful deliberation today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much for those framing remarks. I, I think they give us a great uh, forward path here uh, uh, in this discussion. And we have such a uh, extraordinary um, all-star cast to talk us through some of these issues that the Ambassador raised. Um, if I were to read their full bios and all of their experience, wisdom, and thought, we would take the whole hour and 15 minutes for the program. So let me just say we are delighted to have Dr. Pichet Durangfuraj, who is the former Minister of Digital Economy and Society of Thailand. And given the 4.0 um, uh, goals and the digitized economy that the ambassador mentioned, we're delighted to have you, um, uh, Dr. Pichet, with us. We also have Undersecretary Diane Farrell for Commerce and International Trade. 
a longtime uh, expert on Asia uh, US uh, commercial relations. Delighted to have you. And then we have a really extraordinary panel as well. We have Dr. Luxman Atapic, Deputy Secretary General of the Eastern Economic Corridor Office of Thailand, will uh, um, convey to us uh, the status of that uh, important effort and opportunities for the United States and Thailand. And we have, of course, Ambassador Michael DeSombre, our former ambassador from the United States to the Kingdom of Thailand uh, here as well. And then from the, also from the private sector uh, representing uh, much of the business and commercial elements in the private sector, we have Mr. John Goyer, who's the Executive Director for Southeast Asia at the US Chamber of Commerce. So as you can see, just an all-star lineup, I would refer you to the invitation that we provided you so that you might get further details as you wish to know about uh, their careers, their experience and their work on the important US-Thailand relationship. But with that, let me proceed right straight away uh, to inviting um, our, our first speaker to make opening remarks, Dr. Pichet. Uh, may I please invite you, sir, to make your opening remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Satu. Thank you, Ambassador Manasawi. Uh, and good morning, America. Uh, good evening here in Thailand. Uh, we, we are world apart, but our relationship is very close. I, uh, and I hope we'll be closer after this webinar. Uh, thank you for having me. <clears throat> it has been over two centuries, a long history of deep and special relationship between Thailand and the United States, culminating not only cordial diplomatic relations, but productive and meaningful outcomes, both socially and economically. Uh, I myself actually have a few personal bonds, being an American field service exchange student in the 70s, to Texas, yeah. And uh, also uh, obtained my education from Trinity and Penn in the 80s. Uh, as we are witnessing the rapid changes and unforeseen disruptions affecting not only our national economy and livelihood, there are loose ends here and there affecting the dynamism of our bilateral cooperation as well. It is probably time to renew reconnect and revitalize and make necessary preparations for our economic partnership while trying to end this terrible pandemic together. There are many issues and areas of Thai-US cooperation, but for the benefit of time, let me point to four tangible areas of challenges in economic partnership that in my personal view are significant to our common agenda at this juncture. First, the digital agenda, by far not only the agenda of its own, but also cross-cutting to support other sectors as well. Thailand sits among countries that digitize rapidly in recent years, thanks to the private sector competition and the government spending to modernize our telecommunications and information infrastructure. For the record, we now have 90 million, 90 million mobile phone subscriptions among the 67 million population. We have over 70% of the population surfing the net, while the e-commerce value rises steadily more than 15% each year and value to about 150 billion US dollars last year. In fact, we are fortunate, very fortunate, that various digital platforms have enabled us to deliver services to the public during this difficult time. Let me give you an example. The government financial relief funds transfer, the vaccine administration registration and data management, even food delivery for people work from home. Of course, many American digital companies are here and we certainly can work together to scale up. Yes, scaling up is the name of the game. The uses of digital technologies and platform services, including data centers, cloud services, artificial intelligence, internet of things, robotics, factory automation, you name it. We would be in a better position in my view to do more if many of these companies would establish their corporate offices 
and regional headquarters here in Thailand for economy of scale, cost effectiveness, and comfortable living. The pathway toward post-COVID-19 recovery in Thailand will inevitably gear toward changes and reform in major sectors such as government, education, manufacturing. Digitization would replace the legacy systems that are outdated and inefficient. Even the mega projects such as the Eastern Economic Corridor that Dr. Laksamon can tell you is also investing billions to build the 21st century infrastructure, including the state-of-the-art digital park. Second, the innovation agenda, which leads to partnerships for emerging technologies, supply chain, and industrial linkages. Many US-based and tech-based industrial sectors are already located in Thailand, including electronics, energy, automobile, food, to name a few. The challenges are the rapid changes and disruptions in technologies requiring new and adaptive technologies. Although many companies utilize new research products developed from their headquarters back in the US, but regional market here in ASEAN normally need localization work and regional integration in production supply chains and just-in-time management. My view is for a more formal Thai-US Innovation Partnership Program, Thai-US Innovation Partnership Program to be established with the aim of co-creating innovation, not for the sake of innovation alone, but to strengthen and expand the key capabilities of technology development building resilient supply chain system and maintain the frontier industrial development together in the region and for the region. Third, the climate action. Thailand is a party of the Paris Agreement and has committed to reduce emissions by 20 to 25 percent by the year 2030. Here, mitigation, adaptation, and climate technologies are three key factors. Collaboration to curb air pollution, especially in Thailand, the PM2.5 is urgent due to the level of hazard to public health and to mitigate the pollution emitted from traditional sources, such as carbon monoxide from diesel, methane from livestock, sulfur dioxide from coal-fired power plants, technologies and new production sectors are needed. The mega 10 is quite clear the increasing market demand of electric vehicles and the increasing uses of solar power. Thailand has been hub to autom autom automotive sector for decades and the site for manufacturing facilities of global automakers, US included. It would be cost effective to switch from the production of internal combustion engine to electric using the manufacturing infrastructure already invested and the capable workforce in the auto industry that already possess the skill sets required. As for solar energy, solar market has been growing in recent years. Solar farms, solar rooftops, solar electrification for rural usage are growing. And these may very well be very similar in our neighboring countries. What is lacking, in my view, is the infrastructure to empower the solar agenda. That is the investment in microelectronics, in silicon wafer fabrication. As far as climate adaptation is concerned, the clear target would be the agriculture sector in Thailand. With the increasing frequencies of natural disasters and catastrophes, Farmers are faced with drought, flooding, insect-borne diseases. In my view, precision farming and water management system would be another grand challenges for our bilateral cooperation. Fourth, the health and wellness agenda. First of all, let me say it is gracious of the US government to kindly donate vaccines to us, and we are very much appreciative. As a matter of fact, 
For many decades now, the U.S.-Thailand partnership has been valuable in many healthcare areas, including malaria, HIV AIDS, hepatitis A, and other emerging infectious diseases. It would be a great compliment to the existing cooperation if more research can be jointly conducted and possibly for us to host more of the U.S. pharmaceutical research and manufacturing and to supply to the regional market. In enhancing our economic partnership for this agenda and more, Thailand can act as a bridge to connect our ASEAN friends. We in fact have already in place excellent forums such as the US ASEAN Business Council. We have the American Chamber of Commerce working closely with our Federation of Thai Industries and the Board of Trade. This new chapter of the Thai-US economic partnership, if I may, offer vast opportunities and many proactive actions have already been taken during the past years, such as the ease of doing business programs, smart visa, high-speed internet, cybersecurity and data protection laws and regulations, and the provision of incentives through the Board of Investment, which has been expanding their incentive coverages into these four agenda as well. Last but not least, as Thailand is hosting, the ambassador has mentioned, APEC 2022 next year, hopefully by that time, delegates can meet in person to reconnect among member economies. And to this end, Thailand seeks the US support in many of the exciting agenda we are formulating for the meetings, including the BioCircular Green or BCG initiative. Likewise, we look forward to cooperate with the U.S. hosting the following year, APEC 2023, to make it a great success. On that note, Dr. Satu, let me give the floor back to you. Thank you all for your attention. Sawadikrap. Thank you, Dr. Pitchett, for that extraordinarily uh, clear, uh, very um, action-oriented and forward-looking agenda. I was really taken with some of your suggestions um, particularly including a joint innovation pro partnership program that could be applicable, um, as well as the uh, particular dynamics of improving infrastructure for solar and um, uh, solar energy. So uh, I'm looking forward to further uh, elaboration on these and other issues, but thank you for really getting us off to a, such a, a thoughtful and um, policy-oriented uh, start. Let me, it's now my pleasure to welcome Undersecretary um, Diane Farrell. Uh, for her remarks, uh, opening remarks as well. Welcome, Diane. Well, thank you very much. It's good to see you again. Uh, and I'm totally delighted to be with our audience today and with my esteemed panel of speakers. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Dr. Pichette just gave a wonderful overview. I've got, I, normally I'm thinking about the remarks I'm going to make. Instead, sir, I was co taking copious notes. You were very, very clear. I appreciate that. And I do want to, of course, acknowledge the ambassador who has been a wonderful host on uh, many occasions. And I very much enjoyed our conversation last week uh, to get prepared for today. So that, that too, sir, has been extremely helpful. And I share your enthusiasm in partnership when we speak specifically about APEC 22 and APEC 23. There are many opportunities for collaboration and preparation. And uh, we sincerely hope that, of course, this time it will be an in-person opportunity for us to finally uh, reune and, and to be together again. I, I, I Again, I want to thank the East-West Center because, because uh, the report that you put out, the ASEAN Matters report just last month has been already a wonderful reference document as we talk about the future, especially as we look past COVID-19. And uh, especially when we speak enthusiastically about the opportunities for deeper collaboration between Thailand and the United States. And again, I think that uh, Dr. Pichette uh, laid out some, some very good thoughts that I'll uh, provide further elaboration to as it relates to activities uh, that the US government is currently engaging in. Uh, we, of course, place tremendous importance on Thailand as a commercial and strategic partner 
in the ASEAN region. This relationship very proudly dates back to the establishment of diplomatic ties in 1833 under the Treaty of Amity and Commerce. I think it may have been the first treaty, uh, certainly the first treaty that we've enjoyed with our ASEAN partners. And it's quite exciting as the ambassador knows uh, to see a, a copy of the treaty actually hanging on the walls uh, in the uh, US Embassy in Bangkok. So we, we celebrate a very long and deep partnership and we definitely look forward to the future. Uh, it's a mutually beneficial future. Uh, we can support our bilateral, bilateral strategic alliance, uh, which in turn does strengthen our economic ties. And these days, you know, you can't talk about relationships uh, whether we're talking about security, whether we're talking about global climate change, uh, without, without absolutely acknowledging the utter importance of the economic relationship and making sure that it's stronger. So this is a perfect opportunity for us this morning to, to talk about these ideas. We are, of course, committed to working closely with Thailand and our other allies to advance our shared prosperity, security, and values in the Indo-Pacific region. Despite COVID-19, U.S.-Thailand bilateral trade in goods increased 4.5% in 2020, reaching nearly 49 billion. As of 2019, U.S. direct investment in Thailand was 17.7 billion, making U.S. companies collectively the third largest source of investment in Thailand. As the United States seeks to secure and diversify its global supply chains, we look to partner with security allies like Thailand. The White House's executive order on America's supply chains called for a comprehensive review of critical US supply chains to identify risks, address vulnerabilities, and develop a strategy to promote resilience. In June, the administration released its initial reviews of our four critical supply chains. Those supply chains are one, semiconductor manufacturing and advanced packaging, two, large capacity batteries, three, critical minerals and materials, and four, pharmaceuticals and active pharmaceutical ingredients. The Department of Commerce took the lead on semiconductor manufacturing and advanced packaging review, while the Department of Energy led the batteries review. The Department of Defense led the review on materials and minerals, and the Department of Health and Human Services led the review on pharmaceuticals. The White House reviews recommended that the administration take the following three actions. One, develop a comprehensive trade strategy to support supply chain resilience and U.S. competitiveness. Two, incorporate supply chain resilience into an ongoing review of U.S.-China trade policy. And three, Ensure that the United States works with allies and partners to decrease vulnerabilities in global supply chains, secure supplies of critical goods, and strengthen our collective supply chain resilience. The review stated that in order to secure a reliable, sustainable supply of critical minerals and materials, the United States will need to work with allies and partners to diversify supply chains away from adversarial nations and sources with unacceptable environmental and labor standards. The administration also pledged in the report to build on the success of work with other countries to strengthen engagement with allies and partners to promote fair semiconductor chip allocations, increase production, and encourage greater investment. Looking ahead, the president will convene a global forum on supply chain resilience where governments and the private sector will assess vulnerabilities and develop common approaches to supply chain challenges. I would now like to, supply, to solicit your input on areas where the Department of Commerce can collaborate with Thailand to strengthen supply chain resilience and support our post COVID-19 recovery efforts. Thailand's traditional and emerging manufacturing strengths suggest that it could play a prominent role in US supply chain security in areas such as semiconductors, high capacity batteries, and pharmaceuticals. This should sound very familiar to Dr. Prichet. <laughs> Thailand is already a growing link in the U.S. semiconductor supply chain, accounting for 5.3% of U.S. global semiconductor imports in 2020. That makes Thailand the sixth largest source in the United States of these critical building blocks for our digital economy. 
Thailand doubled its semiconductor export, exports to the United States in the five years leading up to 2020. Several U.S. semiconductor companies have testing and packaging facilities in Thailand, enabling this rapid growth in our two-way trade. As for high-capacity batteries, lithium battery production capacity is the key to meeting the demand for electric vehicles. Thailand aims to have three in 10 of the vehicles it produces be electric vehicles by 2030. And Thailand has the potential to become a key supplier to the United States of high capacity batteries for electric vehicles. Regarding the supply chain for pharmaceuticals, Thailand aspires to become a medical hub attracting foreign patients and medical tourists. Approximately 90% of Thailand's pharmaceutical manufacturing is for domestic consumption, with the remaining 10% for export. A significant supply chain issue for Thailand is that approximately 70% of its active pharmaceutical ingredients are imported from India and China, with the remaining 30% from the European Union. While Thailand has capacity to produce active pharmaceutical ingredients, it is difficult for Thailand to compete with the economies of scale of India and China. Looking at the climate for business broadly between the United States and Thailand, I'd like to highlight the work of the Commerce Department's team in Bangkok and the work of another speaker at today's event, Ambassador Desambri. During his tenure in Bangkok, Ambassador Desambri created a deal team of embassy staff from the Commerce Department and other U.S. agencies to expand U.S. economic activity in Thailand and Thai investment in the United States. The work of this deal team continues today to ensure that the U.S. Embassy does everything it can to bring projects to successful conclusion for U.S. companies. During his tenure, the ambassador supported efforts to improve the business climate for U.S. and other international companies, underscoring that safe, reliable, and secure Asian supply chains belong in Thailand. I look forward to his remarks during the panel discussion. And I want to thank you, sir, because the whole deal team idea has now caught fire globally. And it's something that we have dedicated ourselves to and has attracted the interest of the White House uh, and the National Security Council. So uh, tremendous thanks to you for an enduring idea that we continue to carry forward. Mr. Ambassador. My team and I are ready to work with you to engage the U.S. private sector to find ways to help make our supply chains more reliable and resilient. I thank you again for the opportunity to address this group and to contribute to our understanding of the potential impact of U.S. supply chain policy on U.S.-Thailand economic relations. I very much look forward to the discussion this morning, this evening, and look forward to the recommendations that will come forward. Once again, I am very excited. I know our entire government is very excited about APEC 22 and APEC 23. This will further strengthen our partnership, give us even more reasons to promote these wonderful concepts idea, and ideas, and to show tremendous progress, not just in our bilateral relationship, but toward our mutual interest in leadership in the ASEAN region. And with that, back to you, Satu. Thank you very much. Satu, I think you are on mute. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for pointing <laughs> that out. Um, uh, Undersecretary Diane, thank you so much. That were terrific remarks, almost seamlessly um, integrating with some of the elements that Dr. Pitchett uh, highlighted, and then lifting us right to the next panel discussion, uh, which will include uh, Ambassador de Sombre on new innovations. Um, once again, the U.S.-Thailand relationship becoming a kind of um, a base for uh, adapted ideas and innovations that can uh, strengthen not only the bilateral relationship, but can be applied elsewhere. So with that, let me thank both of you for our opening statements, uh, which, I, as I said, really uh, seamlessly kind of give us ideas to work through uh, aligning um, Thai priorities with some of the efforts that Undersecretary Farrell laid out in terms of our supply chain resilience. Um, on the panel, as I mentioned, we now have an opportunity to hear uh, from three folks, uh, beginning with Dr. Luxman on the Eastern Economic Corridor, and we'll give uh, maybe 10, uh, seven to 10 minutes, uh, Dr. Luxman, and then we will um, go straight into remarks by Ambassador de Sombre, followed by Dr. Uh, John Goyer. Please, may I invite you to make your remarks. Thank you, Dr. Satu, and 
Good morning to all of you in the US and good evening to those of you who are in Thailand. Um, it is my pleasure to be here with you today and to introduce to you the Eastern Economic Corridor and to explore how we can all work together to promote supply chain resilience. It was very encouraging to hear from other secretary Diane Farrell about how Thailand can work with the US on supply chain resilience. The global supply chain disruption in many industries caused by the pandemic revealed certain weaknesses in the existing system of global trade and supply chain. But I think we all agree that reshoring is not an option. Rather, closer cooperation is the solution. I believe that resilient supply chain requires strong multimodal transport network and logistic system to ensure smooth industrial production and logistic operation. With this, I would like to introduce to you the Eastern Economic Corridor or the EEC of Thailand. Um, let me share my slide presentation so we can learn about the EEC together. Right, um, so for, from this map, I hope you can see my screen all right. Yeah, so from this map, you can see that EEC covers three provinces in the eastern part of Thailand. And um, you can see that we are now working on the transport um, infrastructure in the EEC area. So um, we have multimodal transportation. We have the high-speed rail linking Bangkok with the EEC area with the Utapau International Airport. And we also have already two seaports in the EEC area. We are now expanding phase three of these two seaports. Not only logistic infrastructure, we know that it is very important that we also work on the seamless logistic as well. What do I mean by uh, seamless logistic. We are now working to make sure that our national single window is uh, in action so that we can facilitate the linkages and the export and imports of goods. I also would like to share that we design our EEC infrastructure project with not just Thailand's future in mind, but we also take into account the potential demand from our neighboring countries in the Mekong region in utilizing our infrastructure and facility as well. Thailand is also working on what we call the dry port connectivity with the primary objective of servicing as logistic hub in different regions of Thailand connected EEC Lam Chabang Seaport with our mainland ASEAN neighboring countries. This dry port can be easily linked up with similar infrastructure and facilities in our neighboring countries and will allow logistic operation to best utilize the network of Thailand and EEC. I mentioned the national single window. I'm happy to report to you also that Thai agencies are working closely with our US partners to remove pain points pressed by the private sector. For instance, our Thai customs department is working with the leading US logistic firms to pilot new procedures to facilitate cargo clearance and transshipment multimodal transport at Swanapum Airport Zone 3. And we will also implement further reform in the Utapau Airport of the EEC when it is open for business in 2025 as well. There are still a number of challenges that Thailand needs to work on. Several issues listed in the 10 for 10 proposal by Ambassador de Sombre last year are being dealt with at the moment. Thailand has well-established supply chains and favorable business ecosystem in many industries. Given our status as mature manufacturing base in this region, 
particularly in the automotive sector, including the electric vehicle, smart electronics, which include semiconductors, petrochemical, food and bio industries. These industries have long been based in the Eastern seaboard of Thailand, which is part of the EEC today. I would like to say that EEC is a global community of businesses. We have businesses from Japan, from US, from China, from Europe, and many countries uh, working together in our EEC area. Our focus industries, um, we have 12 focus industries in the EEC area. And I think when we look at our industries, we can see the alignment with the expertise and interests of US company and with the sectors that under Sketchery Farrell mentioned earlier. We have recently grouped our focus industries into three plus one clusters, namely, namely health, digital decarbonization, and the plus one is logistics. Under the health sector, EEC is positioning itself to be the center for medical industry. There are already ongoing medical health projects in the EEC. For example, we are working on the Genomics Thailand project at Urupa University. We have the digital hospital campus of Thomasat University in EEC and the Meditao project by Amata Group private sector. I see opportunities for research development collaboration, as well as investment in pharmaceutical, in health services and medical device. It is undeniable that the world's best technology in medicine is available in the US. So we look really look forward to partnership with US. EEC office is under discussion with the Advanced Medical Technology Association or ADVAMED of the US as well on how um, their member can diversify their production base and supply chain to Thailand as a destination for Southeast Asia. As for digital, smart electronics is one of the forefront industrial sector of Thailand. And I do believe that we can certainly strengthen our partnership in the semiconductor sector. There are also opportunities in smart manufacturing, smart city, data related and cloud services. As um, Dr. Pichet mentioned, Thailand is now very well developed with 5G and EEC is among the first area in Southeast Asia that has 100% 5G network coverage, meaning that 5G related business opportunities in EEC are now open. Right now, we are working on a pilot smart city project in Ban Chang Innovation District with a number of US firms, such as Cisco and Malvinia. We are also working on a digital park project for EECD where an ecosystem for digital industries, such as data center, cloud services, and smart solutions are being developed. EEC is fully committed to the concept of sustainability and carbon neutral. We are focusing on reducing carbon emission from industrial sector and encouraging new investment in green and circular projects to improve energy efficiency, to enhance resource and waste management, and to develop ecosystem for sustainable and green businesses. As for sustainable mobility, Thailand aims to increase uh, zero emission EVs share of our automotive production to 30% of all new cars produced by 2030. This is what we call 30 at 30. And we also aim that all new car sales in Thailand will be some sort of EV by 2035. Very ambitious. We have a clear roadmap on boosting the demand side, supporting the supply side, and investing in charging infrastructure, including battery. 
U.S. companies such as EV Lomo has already announced large investment in charging stations in battery in EEC area. And we welcome further participation from U.S. firms on this front. Before I stop, I think I would like to mention that we at the EEC office can work with you to further identify investment opportunities and partnership for supply chain resilience and to facilitate U.S. investment in Thailand. We also provide very attractive privileged packages and ease of doing business. So let me stop here and maybe we can discuss further. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much, Dr. Luxman, for that uh, explanation of the EEC. And I was particularly intrigued by the work you're already doing with specific American companies, but also with American organizations to uh, further uh, cement those relations. So I hope we get more into that as we go forward with the panel and the Q&A session. Uh, it's my great honor and pleasure now to turn over to, uh, to Ambassador de Sombre, who has served the United States, as you know, in the Kingdom of Thailand, and um, I had many innovative ideas to advance the relationship. Welcome, Ambassador, and thank you for taking your time to join us today and make remarks. Dr. Sachin, thank you very much, and thank you to the East-West Center and the Royal Thai Embassy uh, for having me here today. Let me just say it was my greatest honor to serve as the U.S. Ambassador to Thailand. One of my top priorities was to strengthen the U.S.-Thai economic relationship. And as part of that, uh, I was very pleased to hear that the deal team initiative that I put in place is still continuing. Under Secretary, I, I would give most of the credit to the su success of that to the Foreign Commercial Service Officer, John Brinstein, who really took my ideas and really ran with them in a way that uh, was truly exceptional. And very glad to hear that that's still continuing. As part of that process, I also did put in various recommendations, uh, reference the 10 for 10. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But first, I want to discuss sort of the great opportunities that exist at the moment. And let me uh, share my screen if I can. People see this? Hopefully, yes. So I want to talk today about really opportunities and you know, things that are happening at the moment. Ambassador, um, we, don't and see the, we don't see the PowerPoint yet. If we could just have a moment. I know Sarah is maybe working on it. Um, so you we, know, I was supposed to be able to share my screen. Why is it not working? Let's see. Uh, share. Hold on. There we go. Let me share. Ah, there we go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now do you see it? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Perfect. Okay, great. There we go. So let me go up one. So talk a little bit about the opportunity and, and what we can do. I'm very pleased to hear that a number of the recommendations that I put into place have actually already you know, being implemented. I'll talk about one at the, at the end, actually just this week, the cabinet announced various uh, reforms to the immigration and visa process, which are pursuant to some of the recommendations that we made after hearing from various companies of the challenges of bringing in foreign workers uh, to really start businesses and expand businesses in Thailand. But I was also very pleased to hear Undersecretary Farrell talk about the importance of relying upon allies and partners in supply chains, because that really was one of my main focuses and really one of the great opportunities that Thailand has to serve as the location for those supply chains that cannot be reshored back to America. As Dr. Luxman said, not every supply chain can be reshored back to America. Sometimes in America, we don't want to admit that, but uh, nonetheless, that's clearly the case. And locating those supply chains in allied countries such as Thailand provides for that supply chain resilience and allows American companies, particularly that are producing in certain locations, not just for America, but for overseas markets, to have an appropriate place to operate. So we'll talk a little about the opportunities, why Thailand, and then we'll go through a little bit of some of the reforms that I proposed, some of the status of them, and then sort of hopefully where we're going with it. First of all, we see this increasing US-China tension in the world at the moment. Uh, it does not look like that will be changing anytime soon. The benefit of that is that actually provides opportunities for countries like Thailand, because it'll be a one world, two systems, particularly in the digital area, where you will have the opportunity to be part of two different systems, either the sort of US system or the Western system and the China system. And this actually provides more opportunities because rather than having you know, one set of data or economic uh, sort of digital companies dominating the world, you will have two of them competing. 
which will provide much more opportunities for people to, to operate. Because more choice, more opportunities. Benefit of these competing platforms. Secondly, we also see at the moment large global stimulus throwing, flowing through the world. And this is something that Thailand can take advantage of. Companies will have money to be able to move their supply chains, to be able to make investments. We're in a circumstance where money is cheap, credit is cheap. Companies can actually make those investments, which is why Thailand really is in the process of getting itself positioned to be the premier destination for those investments. And a lot of the reforms happening right now, some of which have been mentioned and some of which I know are ongoing, are really designed to make Thailand a much more attractive place for investment. And one of the things I always emphasized in Thailand is the recommendations that I put in place were not designed to help American companies. My belief is always that as long as the environment is a free and open, you know, equal platform for anyone to compete, American companies will do perfectly well. And so the benefit for Thailand is not to focus on attracting American companies. It's just to focus on creating an economic environment that is the most free and open with a level playing field. And then American companies will come and take advantage of that. You already see some of the increased investment in Asia with uh, you know, some of the tech companies emerging, expanding, you know, getting money into Asia. And I think this is an opportunity that will continue for Thailand. Now, when we talk about resupply, uh, US supply chains relocating, the most recent data I saw was from 2019, which showed that there was not as much of it relocating back to you know, Thailand, Malaysia, South Korea, India, more into Vietnam. I think we've seen that a fair amount of it back into the US. This actually shows the opportunity that Thailand has. And I think some of the previous speakers have specifically spoken about microelectronics, about pharmaceuticals, about semiconductors. These are all areas where we really see the opportunity because computer electronics sector accounts for almost half of the drop in US imports from China in 2019. These are the relocating supply chains that are happening right now. And I firmly believe that Thailand, particularly in the semiconductor and microelectronics area, in addition to EVs and cars and, and pharmaceuticals, has a real opportunity. I spent a lot of my time working with, with Taiwan in the private sector with their semiconductor industry representing TSMC for many years. And you, know, you look at the opportunities where Thailand can move from testing and packaging back down into you know, assembly and then you know, manufacturing, I think is an area that would be very attractive for Thailand to pursue and really would help diversify away the supply chain risk that currently exists in the semiconductor area. And you see that Thailand and India still have a very small percentage of US manufacturing imports. And so Thailand, this is a growth opportunity that really does exist. And I think really we wanna take advantage of. Thailand obviously is a natural hub for Asia. Uh, this is it's a center of you know, mainland ASEAN. It's really the center of the Indo-Pacific when you think about India all the way to Australia. So logistically is a critical area. I was very happy to hear Dr. Luxman talking about the multimodal you know, transport reforms that are going on because I spent a lot of time focusing on this specific issue with the main you know, logistical companies trying to just make it more seamless. Thailand is a great logistical hub, but there are certain limitations, particularly in moving things and combining containers that came in by ship versus air and rail. And I, I'm very pleased to hear that a lot of those reforms are in process and are making it easier for Thailand to be a logistic hub for not just mainland ASEAN, but all of the Indo-Pacific. Thailand also is a very large and growing middle class along with ASEAN. And so you've got a lot of spending power, a lot of consumer power that's coming. And this is one of the reasons why it's a very attractive place to locate headquarters for offices and really to be a place where people want to sell not only to the domestic market, but internationally. Moreover, it's a wonderful place to start a business. It's been ranked as you know, the top place in the world for actually commencing a business uh, due to the ease of starting businesses in Thailand. So it's very attractive in that regard. As was mentioned, the digital area is great. You know, we have full 5G in the EEC. We've got 90 million mobile phone subscribers, as Dr. Pichet had mentioned. And you've got the fastest broadband speed you know, in, in Asia, or maybe that's actually in the world. And you've got some of the fastest you know, mobile broadband. So it's a great place for digital operations. It's also one of the happiest places. I, I thought this was a very entertaining, uh, entertaining statistic. I have to admit, having lived in Thailand, I can support this as being literally one of the happier places to live. Really enjoyed living there. It's a wonderful place and truly is a wonderful place to host a headquarters, which is something I know that Thailand's been trying to attract. 
and I think is, is really an opportunity that also exists at the moment. With the continuing US-China tension situations in Hong Kong, people that have had corporate headquarters in mainland China or in Hong Kong are looking at questions of whether or not they should keep them there. At the moment, the more natural or the easier route it would be to go down to Singapore, for example, is obviously doing well at attracting a lot of headquarters. But I believe Thailand really should get its fair share of corporate headquarters because it's most often a very wonderful place to live. One of the largest impediments to that has been some of the immigration and visa, visa issues that have made Thailand slightly less simple in terms of relocating workers and living there and getting spousal visas and children visas and all of that. But it was just announced, and I'll, I'll go through this in a few slides, improvements in that area that were just announced by the cabinet literally two days ago in, in furtherance of the recommendations that I put in last June. Those recommendations resulted in this that has been mentioned, the 10 for 10, which was in collaboration, not just with the US Embassy, but also the Australian, the British, and the German, and the Japanese helped to involve with this as well, to really focus on those biggest areas of friction in investing and operating in Thailand. And you know, I won't go through them in detail here, but I'm very pleased to have seen the Thai government really taking a look at this and understanding the value of trying to do what they can to improve some of these areas. And I think some of them clearly are, are happening already. The multimodal transport that was mentioned, the you know, ability to bring in skilled labor, which is the visa issues, the customs issues that Dr. Luxman mentioned as well, and then a lot of the digitization and other aspects that are, that are in place. And so this is an area that I was very pleased to be able to provide some recommendations. It was very much in the line pursuant to my op-ed on why safe, secure, and reliable supply chain should operate in Thailand, that if Thailand's a great place to do business now, it's a great place to invest, invest. But if you just make a few additional reforms, it can become the premier destination for foreign investment into Asia, particularly in this current environment with the opportunities that are presented, with the investment capital that is available, with the desire of companies to look at you know, their supply chains and, and where they can move to, with the interest of thinking about hedge, headquarters, perhaps moving out of certain countries into other more stable and reliable countries. This is really the opportunity. And it's, I was very pleased to see that the Royal Thai government has really been taking this seriously and trying to implement them as much as they can. And I think we're seeing that, we're seeing that already. One of the other areas I'd made certain recommendations on is with regard to financial institutions and private equity investments. This is an area that is a little bit more challenging just because it's an area where other countries, particularly Hong Kong and Singapore, are a lot more advanced and, and a lot further down the road. But I do think in this area as well, there's great opportunity for Thailand to make certain reforms to attract particularly the fund management area that currently can literally operate out of anywhere because it's essentially remote. Talk to my fund management friends in, in Hong Kong, and it's like if you could move down to Thailand and not have to you know, go through any crazy hoops and, and hurdles to be able to operate down there, would you? And they're like two of one. They say, of course, a much easier, less expensive place to live, wonderful place. And so, I mean, those are areas that Thailand still has the ability, if they wanted to focus on attracting more financial institutions into, into Thailand, that they would have the opportunity to do so. So as I said, the Thai government has been very, very supportive in you know, looking at these recommendations. And I know they've set up a task force under Deputy Prime Minister Supanatanapong to accelerate investment in these five key sectors, you know, smart electronics, pharma med tech, digital cloud, e-vehicles, and then long-term residents. And really to remove the pain points, as Dr. Luxman said, trying to do things that allow businesses to operate more simply in Thailand. And the one, the uh, reforms that were just announced were the ones with regard to the visas to attract, try to attract your 1 million residents to stimulate the Thailand economy, focusing specifically upon experienced professionals, you know, wealthy global citizens, global nomads and others that give them the ability to have their non-Thai income exempt give them long-term visas without the 90-day reporting period. A lot of people uh, don't necessarily recognize that generally even long-term work visas in Thailand have to have a reporting process every 90 days, which is truly a source of friction that it's very good to see the, the government now finally removing, at least with some people. And moreover, also the ability to own land and condominiums if you're one of those qualified individuals. And then finally, this four to one labor requirement, which has been a, a big hurdle for many companies as I, as I tell you know, people in Thailand, you look at an example like Dow Chemical that came to Thailand to create its first joint venture, I think you know, 30 years ago, 
And at that time, you know, you had like 70% of the employees were, were foreigners. Nowadays in that joint venture, my understanding there's over a thousand employees and only one foreigner because they localize. And that's what companies do. Companies localize. Companies don't want to be hiring your foreigners to be running their operations. So you know, one shouldn't worry about the initial period when there may be more foreigners because that's what's needed to bring in expertise, you know, bring in talent. But then that expertise and talent can get transferred to the local you know, people, which trains them and then develops new industries and new opportunities for the local environment. And so it's very good to see that that area is being, uh, being revised as well. So I think in summary, I would just say, you know, Thailand really is a wonderful place to work, a wonderful place to invest. And I think with a few more revisions, it can become the premier destination for Thai or for foreign investment in, in Indo-Pacific. And I'd really encourage those uh, corporations that are on the phone or other people, advisors to really look at Thailand as a place to relocate your supply chain, relocate your headquarters, set up joint ventures, set up manufacturing. You will not be disappointed if you go through that process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. That was a terrific uh, presentation on really concrete action steps and things we could do, and um, also inspirational, particularly the 10 for 10 um, effort that, uh, that you discussed. Let me turn now immediately, uh, as our time grows short, to uh, Mr. John Goyer, Executive Director of Southeast Asia at the US Chamber. John, welcome, and thank you. Thank you, Satu. Uh, Ambassador Manasfi, uh, Ambassador de Sombre, uh, uh, Diane Farrell, my, uh, uh, I would point out former colleague, uh, as she is an alumna of the US Chamber. I'm fond of pointing that out every uh, opportunity uh, that I get. Uh, thank you for, for having me on the, uh, on the program today. Um, a lot of ground has already been covered, so I won't have a great deal to add to it, but I would like to look at the pillar of supply chains, as Dr. Pichet uh, discussed at the outset of the program. And in particular, the angle uh, that I'd like to take today is looking at the export advantages or potential advantages for Thailand in the context of the US-China trade conflict. Recall that in the middle of 2018, the United States began imposing a series of new uh, punitive tariffs on imports from China uh, under what is known as Section 301 of United States trade law. Ultimately, four successive tranches of tariffs were put in place, and these ranged from 7.5% to 25%. Those tariffs led to some rapid supply chain shifts for many products, as producers move some investment and sourcing activity out of China to other countries in order to avoid those tariffs. So I'd like to take a look at US import trends from Thailand from the time that those tariffs took effect through June of this year, and look also at how Thailand compares with its neighbors in that respect. Uh, in addition, I'll try to briefly touch on specific product lists, uh, specific products on different 301 lists that drove U.S. import trends from Thailand. And then finally, try to assess how or whether Thailand has benefited uh, from this trade conflict. And, and I want to say at the outset, we are fans of trade conflicts. Uh, the U.S. Chamber and, and many other uh, business organizations have actually uh, called for the repeal of, of many of these tariffs as they do impose costs. But the reality is that we have those tariffs for now. And so in order to try to measure any tariff advantages that Thailand and others might gain over China, we developed what we called the average tariff advantage, ATA. And we calculate a country's ATA by simply multiplying the share of US imports on a given China Section 301 list by the tariff rate applied to that list. And this uh, will hopefully make a little more sense momentarily. Um, and so uh, to understand the impact of the 301 tariffs, we need to first take a look at the composition of US imports from Thailand and how they compare to the Section 301 tariffs. And in these pie charts, we're distinguishing between lists one through three, which are currently subject to 25% tariffs, and list 4A, which is currently a 7.5% tariff. 
Uh, and you can see here on the left-hand side uh, pi that the largest category of U.S. imports from Thailand at, prior to the, the trade conflict was list three, represented by the gray wedge. Uh, that was 35% of U.S. imports from Thailand in 2017, a figure which is now 44%. 24% uh, of U.S. imports from Thailand were on list 4A, uh, for which tariffs are lower, as I mentioned, 7.5%. Um, and list one and two accounted for 24% of U.S. imports uh, at that time. And that stayed the same in 2021, although there's been shifting between those two lists. Interestingly, 15% of U.S. imports from Thailand were not on any list in 2017. And that figure uh, has now fallen to 4%, which I think provides some evidence that Thailand has indeed adjusted its export mix uh, as a consequence of the 301 tariffs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these two tables are simply uh, showing the percentage of US imports from Thailand and some of its neighbors that fall into lists one through four, those that aren't on any list, and the average tariff advantages, and then the changes between 2017 and 2021. Um, so how does Thailand compare uh, with its neighbors? It's kind of in the middle. Uh, in 2017, it had an average tariff advantage, an ATA of 17%, compared with the Philippines, which is at the high end at 19%, and Vietnam at the low end at 13%. This evolved in the ensuing period, and Thailand now uh, enjoys the second highest ATA among the countries we've looked at, at 19.2%, just a, a hair behind Malaysia, and just ahead of the Philippines. Vietnam remains the lowest at 13.9%. Now, that's somewhat counterintuitive since Vietnam's exports to the US far surpass those of Thailand uh, or any other ASEAN country and have seen dramatic growth. And, and I'll return to that point in a minute. As an aside, the world average ATA is 15.8%. Uh, most countries in Southeast Asia sort of fall in the middle here. Uh, the lowest ATA, which is Ireland, is 3.7%, and the highest is, is 25%, uh, which is, I, I think, Libya. Um, uh, next slide, please. So 25% tariff differential on list one through three which initially accounted for 68% of US imports from Thailand and the 7.5% differential on list 4A, which accounted for about a quarter of US imports from Thailand, we could reasonably expect that Thailand would boost its exports to the United States. And if we look at total US imports from Thailand month by month since the beginning of 2018, uh, we can see that they have indeed uh, increased. Um, this chart may be a little hard to read, but the initial tariffs uh, were uh, put in place in the middle of 2018. And so it took a while for that to uh, have an effect, uh, but the trajectory is upward and that um, is the good news here. Uh, next slide, please. Now, on the other hand, US imports from Thailand have grown every single year since the end of the global financial crisis. So I think the question is, to what extent is the growth that we've seen since 2018 attributable to tariffs? Uh, if you look at the right-hand end of that line, you'll see that the uh, slope uh, is steeper, um, which is evidence that there, there was some benefit, but it's not proof. Um, so would those imports have grown anyway? Would those imports have been even greater had COVID not occurred? Obviously, it's not possible to answer the counterfactual, but I think those are questions we have to consider. Uh, next slide, please. So while Thailand's performance looks good in a vacuum, the fact is that among Thailand's neighbors, Vietnam has seen the greatest uh, growth in dollar terms uh, far and away, uh, followed by Malaysia. Thailand's in the middle of these five countries uh, with Indonesia and the Philippines uh, lagging behind. And you can see that in some places, the patterns um, of, of US imports in dollar terms 
uh, with Vietnam and Malaysia are kind of roughly parallel, but those two countries are benefiting more, uh, even though, as we saw earlier, Vietnam actually has the lowest uh, average tariff advantage. Um, and as an aside, uh, we think Vietnam is sort of a special case due to advantages that it had uh, before the Section 301 tariffs on Vietnam took effect. Um, um, uh, imports from Vietnam had already tripled between 2010 and 2017, and, and uh, potential duty-free treatment under the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, although never realized, uh, likely uh, contributed. Uh, it's, it's plausible that significant investments that were made in Vietnam to take advantage of the TPP simply outweighed any extra benefits that other countries gained uh, from the luck of the, of the China. Uh, tariff coverage. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm cognizant of the time, so I'm trying. I'll try to go through these really quickly. I've just in the in these four, the next four slides are just broken out what uh, performance looks like for the four lists of tariffs, um, and we've indexed it to 100 from the time that the tariff was imposed, um, since it's impractical to show what would otherwise be widely varying dollar figures on, on one chart. The top line result here is that there was modest growth for Thailand, uh, though it was better than every other country except Vietnam. Uh, import growth from Thailand in list one products was driven by uh, a variety of, of goods, including external computer storage devices, medical uh, instruments and appliances. So relating back to what both Dr. Pichat and Diane uh, we're talking about. Uh, gas filtering and, and purifying machinery was also an area of growth on this list. Next slide, please. Uh, Thailand did well on list two with the U.S. imports from that country uh, in, in the category, increasing more than any other, again, except for Vietnam. And so areas here were photosensitive semiconductor devices, uh, various iron and steel structures and parts, and other products. Next slide. Uh, again, Thailand came out in the middle of the pack on list three products uh, behind Malaysia and um, far behind um, Vietnam. Um, growth here, US import growth here from Thailand was driven by products like tires, uh, again, certain other kinds of computer storage devices, power cords, power adapters and converters uh, and the like. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, on, on list 4A, a uh, slightly different story there, given that the initial 15% tariff in that list was reduced to 7.5% a few months later. Uh, and in this instance, Malaysia has done the best, followed by Vietnam, but, but very close to Thailand. Again, uh, <clears throat> imports here driven by computers, uh, digital uh, cameras, certain uh, other kinds of semiconductor uh, storage devices, etc. So. Uh, to conclude, uh, make four quick points. Um, one, <clears throat> while the product coverage and timing of China 301 tariffs are important, they're not destined. The Philippines might have been expected to benefit the most based on having the highest average tariff advantage, yet it was often the worst performer among the countries we've covered here. Conversely, Vietnam um, is the country where the opportunities from China tariffs would have been the lowest on the face of it, yet it's generally performed all the other countries. Point two, the composition of US imports from Thailand shifted from the onset of the trade conflict through June of this year. In 2017, 15% of US imports from Thailand weren't on any of these lists. Therefore, there was no advantage. As of June of 2021, that figure fell to 4%, uh, evidence that Thai exporters are indeed responding to price signals. At the same time, it's evidence, but it's not proof. Uh, US imports from Thailand, as we discussed, have increased for 12 straight years. Uh, therefore, it's not a new phenomenon. Point three, <clears throat> um, you know, a, a rising tide may lift all boats, but in this instance, it doesn't change their positions relative to one another. U.S. imports from Vietnam and Malaysia also grew substantially since the enactment of the 301 tariffs. And then the final point is that 
Um, uh, regardless, the 301 tariffs are likely to be with us for some time to come. Uh, the administration this week, you may have seen, has talked about a, uh, another possible 301 investigation. That might be an occasion to remove some tariffs, as the business community has called for, or it may mean even more tariffs. Either way, there's opportunities here for Thailand, in our view, and so a careful examination of trade flows may point to measures that Thai policymakers could take to assist Thailand-based exporters of products that would otherwise face tariffs if they were coming from China. So I think this is another way of stating that <clears throat> there's a great opportunity here in the context of the US-Thailand partnership to strengthen cooperation in the four areas that Dr. Pichet has outlined and uh, in the product areas that Under Secretary Farrell uh, discussed as part of the White House uh, supply chain review. So uh, let me um, stop there and I apologize for going a little longer than my allotted time. Um, so back to you, Satu. Thank you so much, John, for a terrifically analytical, a kind of rigorous um, assessment of the trade chair out of, arising out of this uh, 301 issue uh, on China. Now, look, as a host um, co um, and, and a moderator for the session, I'm in a dilemma. We've reached the official time of the end of the seminar. But with the graciousness of our wonderful participants, let me run a little bit over um, because there are some questions that I've flagged and I'm giving a couple of minutes by my talk here to invite further questions and comments into the Q&A session. A couple of points have been made already in the Q&A and I wanna flag them for our, for our uh, participants and speakers. Number one, um, we'd like to ask whether if the speakers are willing to make accessible to us the PowerPoints or the text that you have spoken, which will be publicly available on the recording. We can also uh, make them available when we send out the link to the, uh, uh, to the recording of this video event. Um, and that's with your permission only, of course. Uh, so that's one request. Uh, the second thing that uh, has been, uh, um, I wanna take this opportunity to flag uh, to, uh, to give a second for people that bring further questions in, is I want to make um, clear what's going to come out of these seminars. And with the graciousness and cooperation of Ambassador Manasvi, not only do we have these seminars, this is the second, as I said, and we have two more coming up, forging uh, Thailand-US Climate and Energy Partnership next. And we will, of course, uh, inform you when we can get all the speakers lined up and ready to go. And we're also planning a people-to-people -people exchange discussion on the ways in which our countries continue to have robust people-to-people -people exchange, which is the basis for doing any business, for doing any policy coordination and cooperation. And then we will be presenting a report uh, of a group of experts and um, uh, you know, knowledgeable folks on the US-Thailand relationship that we will have some recommendations in as well. And then finally, a series of analyses that we will publish in the Asia Pacific Bulletin Series from experts in civil society, academia, policy, think tanks of both countries, so that we will have this corpus of material, uh, recordings, reports, analyses, and exchanges to build on and look for implementing these ideas and building those relationships. So I just wanna make that clear. Let me turn to the first question that I got, and it builds on, um, the uh, John Goyer's uh, presentation. And that given some of these opportunities, this comes from Pavin Panarat, obviously, as you know, uh, a colleague at the Royal Embassy, given some trade opportunities for Southeast Asia from Section 301 on China, how long do you expect this will last given the increasing pressure on the new administration uh, for more clarity uh, on trade policy with China? In other words, uh, you know, we're assuming that these the tariffs and all the other issues that apply to China won't change. And I wonder what kind of impact that will be. John, do you want to start? And then I invite others, uh, since this was directed to your presentation, and then we can invite others to make comments too. Sure. Uh, thanks, Satu. Uh, thank you for the question. Well, the short answer is we don't know how long these are going to last. Um, Diane may be a little better place to speak to that than I, but what I would say is that 
we're not getting the sense that the administration is in a hurry to lift those tariffs. Um, and uh, although the business community pressure is there, we'll, we'll continue to push for it. Uh, it's not clear to us how long uh, they're, they're gonna be in place. Um, National Security Advisor Sullivan will be giving a speech <clears throat> in the coming days, which is meant to outline what the US Indo-Pacific strategy uh, really entails. And, and I suspect that speech may shed uh, on that question. But I, I think for the time being, it, it's really, um, uh, it would be incumbent on Thailand and, and other countries in the region to really look at what the advantages are in light of the tariff differentials, uh, where those touch on the four pillars that Dr. Pichet uh, discussed uh, and where those relate to the White House's supply chain review. Use that as a starting point. A lot of the increases in um, US imports from Thailand are in products that don't relate to the, uh, to certainly to the, the White House's supply chain review. They're, they're in other areas. So I think a more thorough examination might point the way to some optimal uh, policy prescriptions. Thank you, John. May I invite um, others panelists if they wish to make a comment on this issue that was raised about the overall climate and how we could take advantage in the US Thai relationship? Anyone else? Well, let me then address a second uh, question that has come up in our chat. Um, and this relates to the strengthening uh, of the US dollars uh, relative to ASEAN currencies. Um, the quite specific question is, would you think the graphs of US import trend would give a different perspective in comparing the trends among ASEAN countries? If I understood that correctly, you know, just exactly how much is the value of the dollar affecting uh, the trends that you identified, John? Sure, well, <clears throat> it's a good question. We haven't mapped that out in this analysis, but, um, it gets to a point that I should have made, which is that the tariff differentials, while they're substantial, they're not everything. I mean, there are a lot of factors to consider. Thailand, Vietnam, and Malaysia have all done pretty well. Um, and if you look at where those countries stand on the, on the World Bank's Doing Business Index, and Ambassador de Sombre had, had this point in one of his slides, <clears throat> you'll see that they're all higher than Indonesia and the Philippines, which are much lower. Uh, on that same index. There are questions of production capacity, pr questions of productivity. There are workforce issues. There's questions of transportation and logistics. So it's a much more complicated picture than simply tariffs. Um, and, and certainly um, currency valuations are a part of that. Um, but I think that they're one of many um, factors in a, in a complicated equation. Anyone else on that issue? Otherwise, I'm going to raise one general question um, for, for, and I'd really like, we've talked a lot about the US-Thailand relationship and the ways in which there are reform, there are priorities in the US, priorities in Thailand, such as the EEC, that, um, and policies on both sides that affect, fine. Those are kind of ways in which this US-Thailand relationship can be advanced forward uh, based on those uh, variables. I guess I would like to know how important you think, especially since both countries are hosting APAC, uh, you know, as you, we've discussed consecutively, how important is laying down the rules and norms of wider elements of commercial relations? WTO reform, um, you know, as you well know, CPTPP is in the region, RCEP is in the region. How important are those? to giving opportunity to advance the US-Thailand relationship? Because we're not aligned on those. That is to say, you know, the US is not an RCEP, but Thailand is. Uh, neither of us are currently in CPTPP. Um, we have different interests in the global trading regime because Thailand has, the last time I looked, quite robust EU relations as well in terms of commerce and investment. If you look at a Thai EU profile, it's really, you know, it's, 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 it's robust. So how should we use our 
consecutive APEC to advance kind of more regional and global normative and regulatory uh, frameworks for advancing the partnership. Who would like to maybe start on that? Do I see any takers? Maybe act, uh, acting uh, under secretary, Diane, would you like to go? There we go. I was trying to hit the unmute button. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's a great question. And again, I think it shows a lot of promise. Just a couple of general comments first. Number one, I, you know, I, our, I, this is a message that when I was in Thailand in November of 2019 for the East Asia Summit, uh, then our then Secretary Ross uh, made, and I think it's it still holds true, and it's definitely uh, part of the the fabric of discussions that we're having with our trade partners globally, and especially with a focus on uh, on the on the region, on the Indo Pacific region, um, and I think that the I, I think. Uh, that uh, Ambassador de Sombre hit on it really, really well uh, in terms of market access uh, challenges. And I think his 10 for 10, the one world, two systems. I mean, that, that was incredibly insightful. And uh, the clarity of his message and his ability to be talking to um, parties outside of just Thailand, I think speaks to the, the potentials with APEC in terms of broadening the message mm -hmm. to just the bilateral relationship in the same way that what John has talked about um, doing an analysis of 301 is really, really interesting. And I do want to say that uh, in the last eight, nine months since the Biden-Harris administration came in and, and since our secretary came to Commerce in March, uh, she has spent a tremendous amount of time uh, both leading and guiding uh, internally the staff to be doing the kind of drill down analysis that John was talking about uh, in terms of the chamber's work. And she has had a very open door policy in terms of meeting with industry. She really wants industry inputs. She's a former governor, as people know. So she knows very directly what it takes for companies to be successful in her state, but also uh, you know, what that means for the US writ large. So she is very inclined to reach out um, and, and she takes it, her perspective is just a, an extremely interesting and helpful perspective. Both of their messages, though, would be very similar to what Ambassador de Sombre described in terms of, you know, what we can do together. Now, on the broader opportunities that we talk about with uh, regard to APEC, if you look at the Biden-Harris administration's focus and priority, uh, they talk about climate change. Uh, they, I mean, and they're not just talking, they're walking the walk on climate change. I can tell you that internally now when we prepare reports and documents, including just submitting our budget plans uh, for going forward, we now have two additional slides that we include in addition to the traditional breakdown of costs, et cetera. One is on uh, global climate change and how um, our individual uh, bureaus, departments, units, uh, the department itself as a whole is addressing that Biden-Harris priority. That is clearly, and as the, um, um, as uh, our ambassador uh, and I discussed on Friday, that's clearly an area of opportunity and uh, and uh, collaboration uh, that Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, that Ambassador uh, Monsavi and I talked about. Uh, and the other one is probably looking at equities uh, and looking at um, our ability to uh, scale uh, programs that will actually provide skills. Uh, for the 21st century and beyond. So there are some very broad opportunities uh, that we clearly share a kinship with when we talk about our ASEAN partners, our APEC partners, uh, that I think can be part of the collaboration as we uh, work with our colleagues in Thailand uh, and carry forward some of those uh, general principles, objectives, priorities, uh, into the the following year, so I I, just, I think we're in a great position. You know, I'm I'm so pleased that I've had the opportunity professionally, as John mentioned, um, my our, our chamber kinship uh, since I was previously the deputy assistant secretary for Asia. Uh, I'm really pleased just to see the opportunities and the potentials because they can be great. 
and your and John slides very interesting and you know we can parse whether you know it was 301 or to John's point it could be other market forces that we can't control and COVID of course throws a monkey wrench into everything uh, but but that said there's just no question I mean the potential the opportunity the focus going forward into the future is in this region and I I, I agree with Ambassador DeSombre Thailand can really be at the heart of a lot of that. And as I mentioned uh, to Ambassador Monsavi on Friday, if you look at you at the US government placement of some of its critical centralized facilities, they're in Bangkok. So we're already there when it comes to US government recognizing the importance of Thailand as a strategic and an investment partner uh, and an economic partner. And I think I, I just I'm very excited. I think this is this gives us another catalyzing opportunity to to really uh, take advantage of the two APEC years and to do even greater things in terms of cementing uh, even strengthening ties between the US and Thailand. Well, wonderful, Diane. That was such an inspirational way, and we've offered an extra 15 minutes, so I do think it's fair, especially as it is late evening uh, in, in, in Thailand. Um, so I want to just uh, say thank you for those really inspiring and closing remarks. I think it gives us a way to work ahead, and that's what this whole series of webinars and the whole entire project is about, is concrete, forward-looking ways to advance the U.S.-Thailand partnership. And I'm absolutely delighted that all of you joined us today at, um, from far-flung places and times. Thank you sincerely, Ambassador Manasvi. Of course, uh, always your graciousness and, and your uh, uh, partnership on this effort. Thank you, all the speakers. We'll be in touch with the recording and as we discuss with each uh, participant, making available their remarks or their PowerPoints, uh, we, will, uh, we will communicate with you. So thank you all um, uh, for joining us. Good night, good day, and look forward to seeing you for the next seminar on the US-Thailand partnership. Goodbye, everyone.